Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Deep Dive, the most interesting segment of the Decred Assembly, where we go super in-depth into a specific area. Uh, I've, I'm Dustin Lefebvre. With me today is Jake Ilkampayat, project lead, mm -hmm. project co-founder. It's good to have you here, Jake. Um, normally, we would have a guest, but today, we're just talking to you because we're talking to you about a proposal that you made. Yeah, we're keeping it local. We're both here in Chicago in the studio here, and uh, you I'll just be... gave up our. Oh my gosh! What you gave you gave up our location. What you, we're being targeted no right there's now. There's no cover to blow here, Dustin. Mm -hmm. You know, you can infer that we are in Chicago without great difficulty. Who is doing this? Oh my God! Ah, oh, cover oh, blown. Well, well, I get. Well, I get. Well, I guess I got to burn the house down and All leave right. town. Burn it down, build a Dex. Okay. So let's. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, you know, you proposed very recently a, a, a proposal for a Dex, a decentralized exchange. Uh, I guess conceived, designed, and, and to be implemented in the form of Decred. Uh, so tell us first off why you did that. So the the reason I did this was, you know, as project lead for for you know for Decred. I've, I've witnessed a number of problems. The real reason that Decred came around in the first place was it was a reaction to the central planning committees that, uh, or central planning committee that I encountered with Bitcoin. And as a result, my interest ended up drifting to uh, Memcoin 2, or D, which became Decred, because it uh, eliminated that central planning committee. Or it basically, it, it, it proposed an infrastructure that allowed us to dissolve that central planning committee. Right. And that was very interesting to me. So I figured, okay, great, this is an excellent way to roll. And something I've noticed in running the project for you know the three years that we've been live is that liquidity and markets are becoming increasingly a you know a roadblock to expanding the influence and you know market cap of the project, especially relative to other projects. So so is the key issue here uh, centralization and, and the you know the desire to decentralize the exchange process. Well, there's a well, there's a few things, right? So there's really there's three things that this Dex I'm proposing does. So first of which is that we're we, we're removing barriers. Anyone who's at all familiar with the uh, cryptocurrency process or cryptocurrency uh, project, uh, you know, space knows that in order for your project to be relevant, you have to get listed on these exchanges, and so that is a huge barrier to entry. Then there's another element, which is well, an but Decred's oh. listed on a bunch of these exchanges, right? I that's, mean, that's right. OK Coin, USD, Fiat. You've got Binance. You've got all kinds of exchanges. People can get Decred, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what's what's the ba what's the issue beyond well, that? Well, the issue I would I would argue is that getting on and staying on these platforms is a huge barrier. If you want to be listed on major exchanges, you have to give up a lot, whether that's monetary, time, energy. The politics of getting on to these things is, is, is serious. So while Decred is on a lot of exchanges, getting on all the rest of the exchanges is, you know, it's a serious production. Then, if anyone wants to trade Decred on, any, on the bulk of these exchanges that are centralized, they have to give up all kinds of paperwork and documentation in order to, you know, actually use the platform. So that's, you know, that's another component of this. You know, that's another kind of permissioning, even though let's pretend we instantly Decred was listed on every exchange. Mm -hmm. Everyone who goes to, you know, the major exchange platforms is still going to have to give up all kinds of personal information to these entities, which effectively means that exchanges are almost like the new banks in the, in the context of cryptocurrency. So the, the existing surveillance state Right, where if I want my bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, to do something for me, they basically have to make the decision for me, whether or not I can do that. Is that the way that these centralized exchanges are operating today? Yeah, and in in most cases, this isn't a function of the people who operate the ch the exchange choosing to do this. It's really a regulatory requirement yeah. that's enforced by the banks they use for their fiat liquidity. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know the regulatory requirements of operating a centralized exchange are onerous, and the reason that, the reason that's the case is because you're taking custody of other people's funds. So as soon as you start taking custody of people's money, there's all kinds of extra rules that kick in, like uh, you know, like the Banking Secrecy Act, Bank Secrecy Act, and the um, you know money transmitter regulations, which are state by state, which is especially challenging to comply with. Okay, so how will it? So if you build a decentralized exchange, how will that remove the need for 
AMLKYC? So th there are a few ways that people have proposed DEXs uh, to date. What we're, what we're proposing here, it'll take me a little too long to go through everybody else's model, but okay. there's a variety of, you know, there's custodial decentralized exchanges, there's non-custodial decentralized exchanges. We're proposing a, uh, a non-custodial uh, DEX, and the reason we're doing that is because what, what I was able to figure out, uh, having looked at atomic swaps, is that there really is no need for an intermediate when you're talking about exchange. So if you and I want to exchange, you know, like let's say you have Bitcoin and I have Decred, mm -hmm. th there's literally no, there's no need to have anyone take any custody there. You can use the atomic swap smart contract to affect that exchange with mm -hmm. almost zero risk between, uh, you know, the counterparties. So if somebody else has, let's say, a token in the middle there, or, or they're putting you through a, a third party, is that simply rentier behavior? Yeah, and that's and that's another one of the you know uh, that's another one of the points that I think is relevant mm -hmm. here is that there's a th there's a lot of people looking to take a an existing business model and project it into the cryptocurrency space. That is effectively use a token or a or a standalone blockchain as a cutout for a you know a, a classic centralized corporate entity. And exchanges are no exception. People are people are used to exchanges being a place that's super regulated. You go there, they take custody of your stuff, and then they charge fees for trading and so on. And and that business model, people are trying to project that into mm -hmm. the cryptocurrency space. So there are, there's a number of tokens and blockchains that are trying to do that are basically you know uh, porting this same the same business model to the uh, cryptocurrency space, even though there's literally no requirement for this intermediate chain. It's just sort of a hey, we we want we we'd like some rent, please, and you yeah. know, that's the model. So, can you explain a little bit? You, you mentioned atomic swaps. Explain a little bit more uh, in detail how the decentralized exchange would work. For sure. What, yeah. what will be built? Yeah. So, so, so the 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 core the core component of it has already been built. We have mm -hmm. we have a, a repository called Atomic Swap under Decred's GitHub, and that repository has the tools for us to people to independently between a number of blockchains perform ex perform swaps using this process called the Atomic Swap. So this is getting to the the permission issue that you're talking about, right? Anyone can institute this software, you know, atomic swaps. Um, are you saying that any project, if they uh, enabled atomic swaps, they would be welcome at the DEX? As long as, you know, as long as your, uh, your project supports atomic swaps, uh, atomic swap uh, contracts, mm -hmm. then you can, you can have a developer or a few developers add support for that to our atomic swap repo, and then the tools that we have already will work with, uh, you know, with with that currency, and that really removes this whole game of getting listed on exchanges. Mm -hmm. Which is that ultimately, what you would need to do is just make sure you support the atomic swap, uh, you know, contract, and then bang, you could set up you you or someone related to the project, or you know, you know, you know, uh, what is it? A like a you know a benevolent host can set up. One of these exchanges, uh, you know, between your currency and the other ones out there. Okay, so the barrier you're saying is just the ability to install atomic swaps. How much of a barrier is that? Getting getting atomic swaps working, just to put it in perspective, is as soon as I, you know, I had been sort of poking around and thinking, oh, this exchange, you know, I was frustrated with exchanges, and I did some mm -hmm. poking around, and then I heard about atomic swaps, and then. I'd heard about atomic swaps in the context of them working on Lightning Network, and that, uh, you know, that's obviously one use case. And then I was, uh, I was actually talking with, uh, you know, uh, Lalu. Uh, he's the lead dev for LND at Lightning Labs. I was talking with him, and it occurred to me to ask him, "Do you actually need LN to do this at all? Can't you just do this on chain?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, you can do it on chain." <laughs> and uh, and then I, I, you know, I talked with uh, one of my developers, and within two weeks, we had the tools to go between uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and Decred, and mm -hmm. also Litecoin. So we built those to, that tooling out in a period of like one one dev in two weeks. Okay, so not a, a fairly low entry barrier. Anyone can come and join. Mm -hmm. it, it, how is it going to look if if you know you have Bitcoin and you want to accept? And, and you want to switch that for Decred? 
Well, you know, that exchange process, the, you know, the way the process works is it uses an atomic swap. Maybe I should make a little bit of a detour and just explain how the atomic swap works. So the atomic swap works where one, one party initiates the exchange. Let's say it's me. Mm -hmm. I initiate that by publishing a smart contract that's a pay to script hash. That's a detail, but not everybody needs to understand that. I publish a transaction that has a script hash. And the, and the script that corresponds to that has a hash puzzle in it where it says, um, if you can generate the pre-image of a hash that's published, then you can take control of these coins. I publish that particular smart contract or a, or a hash of the contract. Mm -hmm. I send the contract to you, if you're the person I'm doing the exchange with, then you publish an analogous contract on a separate blockchain. Mm -hmm. When you do that, I can take control of your coins by publishing the solution. Okay. When you see that solution published on your blockchain, you can then take control of my coins on, on my chain. So it, it sounds like it's perfectly trustless. It, is it, there any way to game it? Or, or? The, the only way to game it is if, there are, uh, if there's negligence on one or both sides of the contract. In the sense that if, let's say, let's say uh, you know, I take your coins, but you mm -hmm. forget to take mine. <laughs> <laughs> then you can you can get yourself into some trouble there, but the, the, isn't, isn't that kind of fair? Yeah, it's kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. I gave you the ability to take the money off the table. You left the money if, on the table. Now it's mine, right? I, that's 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 real life, though. Yeah. Right. That that seems fairly reasonable. Well, well that's as good as you can do with uh, you know without adding a lot more complexity to the smart contract infrastructure. Okay. So you know with basic smart contracts like the kind that that, that are in uh, Bitcoin called transaction script. Mm -hmm. You can do this, and um, you know, making it totally idiot-proof is you know is difficult. But the way this would work is that once the Dex is built, this will happen effectively automatically via a client to the Dex. So that so that the process of say me collecting your coins and you collecting my coins mm -hmm. would actually be taken care of by software. So the probability that you know that coins are going to get left on the table and somebody's going to be like howling about this and really upset is really low. But it is, but it is, it is the only you know part of the process that's kind of potentially problematic. Fair enough. So, can you detail a little bit about how this marketplace comes together? What is it going to look like, and how will people know about it? I think that you know it'll start um, via a proof of concept. Every piece of software, you know, you can try people who try to make really polished things and then just push them out the door. In a lot of cases, it just ends up being like it's junk underneath. And they focus on that like last little, you know, that last centimeter of polish on the outside. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, <laughs> never seen that before in the crypto space ever. Get big fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally new business model. Fake it till you make it. Never seen that before. So uh, th the way this would look is that it would start out as something that would be sort of a, you know, like a dev tool, mm -hmm. and then eventually you end up putting a GUI over it so that everybody can use it. And the way it would work is is that. The DEX would effectively be something very similar to an email server. It would be it would be effectively an exchange mail server. Okay. Know, even though I feel like exchange and mail server is a little overloaded already. <laughs> okay. So Microsoft jokes aside, uh, the you know the process that we that we would end up having is is that let's say we want to start doing exchange. I would fire up the server. Mm -hmm. Boom, the server's running, and then. And then you might be a client, and you go, "Oh, hey, I want to, I want to put up an offer to buy or sell some decred at a, you know, at a certain uh, price. Let's say it was in Bitcoin, so it was a, D, a DCR BTC pair. That would, you know, you can show up and create. That's called a limit order. Mm -hmm. People can place these standing orders. Then uh, other people might come along, and go, you know what? I want to buy or sell, you know, uh, one of those orders." That pro they'd come along and they'd do a market buy or sell, and sometimes they'd get matched with you. And so, and so the way this ecosystem would show up is it would effectively be more or less like the way mail servers work, which is you mash a few buttons, you run a, you run a, you know, a, what is it like a mail transfer agent on, a, you know, on a machine, and then you give your friends passwords, and then bang, they have email, and then you have DNS, and all the email comes to the machine. So it would be similar to that in the sense that. Hey, let's say let's say there's four or five big, uh, you know, Dex servers that are in use, mm -hmm. and you're like, you know what? I don't want to use any of these. I want to run my own Dex server. Boom! You can get it up and running in a period of like five or ten minutes, and so that's sort of the you know the idea for the infrastructure. And, and I feel like that's more appropriate than having a standalone blockchain. Not only because the blockchain is is effectively you know there's no, really no reason for it to exist, 
but also because it's more censorship resistant. If you can fire up a server anywhere, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult for people to turn, force everyone to turn off these servers. Sure. Now, if someone is hosting one of these servers where people get together to exchange funds, it, could that be considered a, a, a money exchange business? I would argue that it is not. Based on the way that the, uh, you know, that the current regulations stand, all of it revolves around custody. I know I mentioned this a little mm -hmm. bit earlier, and that's why, you know, say centralized uh, cryptocurrency exchanges have to do all of this work when it comes to uh, custody. They need to make sure that, you know, you don't have criminals working for the organization. You need to make sure that the people who own the organization aren't criminals. You need to make sure that you record all the information. All of these things that have to be done all revolve around custody. You are taking you are taking custody of someone else's uh, assets or you know value, mm -hmm. so then you know you need to be vetted. And once you remove that, you remove the main threat model for uh, you know uh, you know for these organizations. If no one can steal the money, then do we still need to fingerprint everybody in the organization? <laughs> and so starting these things, it, while it's conceivable that these uh, you know that these servers could be argued to be uh, you know money transmitters, I would uh, you know based on the current regulations, that's an incredibly difficult argument to make. It's a, it's a bit of a leap. Right? Indeed, yeah. So talk talk a little bit about the order matching, right? Because you've got limit orders and market orders. Um, how how are things more fair in this dex than other dexes. Yeah, I feel like I've hit two of two of the mm -hmm. major points that I would, that, you know, that I that I think uh, are behind the you know the dex idea. First, being make it permissionless, and so you can get a listing without you know jumping through hella hoops and paying money and doing the dance. And the second one was. Uh, was rent seeking. You know, there's really no need for this third, you know, this third party chain or token. And so so fairness is really the missing ingredient. So mm -hmm. fairness comes from the order matching algorithm. Matching by, you know, market orders and limit orders mm -hmm. is something that you know, historically is done uh, I, if I'm if I recall correctly, there's really two algorithms that are used for this. One is first in first out FIFO, and then the other one would be a pro rata process. And pro rata means that you know uh, if um, if a market order comes in, it will be pro rata filled across the uh, limit orders at a given price level. That's a detail, but the mm -hmm. upshot is is that I don't feel like either of those processes are particularly fair, and the reason is that they're both easily gamed by high frequency trading algorithms. And to get away from that, I feel like you need to change the uh, you know the order matching algorithm. And what I've proposed here is to make an order matching algorithm that's pseudo random so that you might have a whole bunch of limit orders mm -hmm. at various price levels, but the order in which the market orders are matched against the limit orders makes all the difference when it comes to trading. In many cases, people will, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of speculative traders mm -hmm. that will game this. Like, for example, if you have a machine in a colocation facility right next to the uh, right. you know the the uh, what is it the uh, exchanges servers mm -hmm. your latency is lower than everybody else's and so you so why can... the real estate so expensive <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh, that's certainly true I've the seen... rent is too damn yeah, high the rent is too damn high I've spent a lot of time in co-location facilities and man I, the rent is too damn high particularly at the one uh, the Equinix facility in in downtown Chicago <laughs> which I will never ever return to under right. any circumstances so high frequency traders are not going to be advantaged on this dex correct the idea the idea with pseudo random order matching is to take away this first in you know this this cutting in line because the way the incentives are set up is you're highly incentivized to cut in line it's like going to a grocery store where everybody's trying to get groceries yeah and then you cut in line only to sell your groceries back to somebody who's like two two steps Th back this you seems know, and make a little bit of money this seems really unfair to the high frequency trading community yeah <laughs> <laughs> that is what the high frequency trading community thinks I mean if you go and look at the at the comments on you know on this proposal yeah. that in the past it was like it was 92% approval so massive approval huh. but the comments on it man there's some people who really are not fond of this idea of pseudo random order matching and you know sort of like uh, you know permissionless exchange well, did they hire enough lobbyists within the decred community to affect the votes well apparently <laughs> apparently they didn't get that far ahead on that front they have they, they, they haven't gotten to the uh, br you know uh, the rebranded bribing of politicians, you know, that's a that's the yeah. next step. Well, apparently, this is part of the decred maturation process. Apparently, 
<laughs> <laughs> Bribing the stakeholders. People have been proposing that, though, right? Yeah, I, you know, there's all kinds of interesting proposals out there. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, can you can you talk about, you know, you've got your MVP. Eventually, you'll put a GUI on there. Uh, talk about what the next steps would be to building out this, this network of servers. Well, I feel like, you know, uh, from a, there's there's a mesh to build out of it. That mm -hmm. is that just a single server by itself, hey, let's say it goes offline or gets taken offline, that's bad. In the grand scheme of things, what I, you know, what I sort of see as the, uh, you know, as the future here is a mesh of these servers, similar to how blockchains work, right? There's a mesh of servers that do, uh, you know, P2P uh, communications, and then that forms the, you know, the, you know, the, uh, what is it, the backbone of a blockchain, is we would have a similar network of these servers mm -hmm. um, for exchange in general. So, for example, the DCR BTC pair, we could have, there could be 20 of these machines around the planet run by different people, and then they have links in between them so that when limit orders and market orders get submitted to one, they get relayed to the rest of the network. Now, because the order matching is pseudo-random, and in order for it to be pseudo-random, there have to be epochs, right? This idea right. that it's pseudo-random within an epoch. Because there's epochs, you've already got uh, you know, a, a latency baked into it so that mm -hmm. there's not this latency sensitivity so that you could have an order submitted in Siberia, bounces through three servers sure. to, some, you know, to another DEX server in, I don't know, South America, and it, the, the orders could get matched on other sides of the planet without, one, without people being able to game that really heavily. Sure. So it sounds like an epoch is going to be at least more than a few seconds on Probably, the scale of a minute. I was thinking 10 seconds and 10 up. seconds? Yeah, yeah, the idea being that you know satellite uplinks are often have a latency on the order of two, two to three seconds, mm -hmm. so like two to 3,000 milliseconds. And because of that, you'd want an epoch to be you know, definitely bigger than a satellite uplink so that, hey, if somebody's on a satellite uplink, it's like, hey, you can still trade cryptocurrency and not get screwed on price. Yep. So it sounds like the DEX, right, obviously flows from the same principles that the, you know, that the Decred project really does, right? Mm -hmm. per permission, you know, you know, permissionless and fair. But what about liquidity, right? Because there's so many DEXs out there already, right? And, and the big critique is that nobody uses them or there's a thin order book, right? Um, so why would this one be different? Well, uh, Decred is a specific, in, specifically is interesting in this regard. That is that, you know, the project itself and the various, uh, you know, supporters of the project have, have, have done very little to artificially prop up the trading on other exchanges. So when, if you look at the order book for Decred across, you know, across the various exchanges, it's really relatively thin, both on the buy and the sell side. Thin, or some would say real. Right, ninety-five well, percent of the trading volume. Ninety-five percent of Bitcoin trading volume has mm -hmm. been shown to be very likely fake. Yeah, or, or varying degrees of fake, okay. and th you know that pro you know that is a cue to be like there's very little real volume mm -hmm. in in the cryptocurrency space, and so in my opinion, it's really all about volume is a bit of a decoy. Is that pe what people really should be looking at is order book depth, and even order book depth. You know, Decred has a pretty limited order book depth in comparison to other mm -hmm. projects. And so what the DEX, you know, what that liquidity would look like is that the uh, order book would get a lot deeper. And, you know, how we're going to get there to the deep order book is that a number of people have expressed interest to me in participating with the DEX in this context. A big barrier to entry is both the KYC AML process for centralized exchanges and then also just the rent seeking for these, you know, for these other, uh, you know, DEX products. Not to mention, none of these other DEX products do pseudo-random order matching. So they're just, it's yet another, it's basically HFT-friendly business model ported into a blockchain. And that, you know, I think we need to get away from that so that we can build the new future as opposed to like, you know, say have somebody, who, somebody who's really sharp with HFTs pump what little real liquidity there is out of the system, you know, and constantly be scalping people on every trade they make. <laughs> because, I mean, that's how these systems work. And so... You know, you figure if you've got a system that's only got a very limited amount of liquidity and action, you have to be you have to be proactive about defending it against people sucking that liquidity out. Sure. So the people that are interested, if they're Decred community members, are, are you know, would they have just Decred, or would they have other cryptocurrencies to, you know, to, to basically stack the order volume? Or well, the I think order that volume? I think that what we're going to see is this: is that uh, Cryptocurrencies and their prices, it, it's all a bit of a battle for relevance, right? 
Everyone out there has, has, a, has a different piece of technology. They're all trying to achieve something different. But the battle for relevance is often, you know, sort of proxied via market cap. And I think that, you know, if you want to be part of the battle for Decred's relevance, you know, we're going to encourage you to participate on the decks, you know, to some extent. That doesn't mean you need to be the person right there on the front line who has the, who has the limits right there at the market and is constantly, like, adjusting things. But it could mean that, you know, hey, you're like, I believe in Decred, and so I'll put up a limit buy order. You know, maybe it's a mm -hmm. bit out of the money. But that process is something that we need to, you know, undertake as a community to increase our relevance. Okay. W what about the critique that someone would say, you know, money is going to come in, right, mm -hmm. from the fiat world. And money from the fiat world is different, right, because that expands the pie, and that's really important. Um, does the DEX kind of ig ignore that? It necessarily has to, and the reason it has to is because atomic swaps don't work with fiat currencies. Yeah. There are a number of people who are trying to make that process work better, you know, like, for example, having a stable coin that you can then atomic mm. swap with. So there are ways to proxy things like this. Like, for example, if you had a stable coin that was locked to the U.S. dollar, and then that had that, you know, that cryptocurrency or that token had, was atomic swappable to Decred, then you could have a synthetic pair. Here's another thing to think about, which is that, you know, there's this argument that, oh, fiat liquidity makes everything so much better. It does from, a, for, you know, from an on-ramp and off-ramp perspective, right? If you, if you have U.S. dollars and you want to buy Decred, that's great, or you have Decred and you want to get U.S. dollars, that's great. But there's also, you know, what's to say someone couldn't have a DCR BTC pair and then just adjust their positions to track the, some U.S. dollar exchange rate. Right, so it's just it, 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 so so there's a bit of relativism involved. Sure. So tell us about what is next, right? Now that the the Dex has passed in Politea, what what what's uh, what are the next steps? Well, the next step will be, and you know, I'll be making this proposal uh, and working with uh, the developers at, at C Zero on it. Is the is is to propose a uh, what is it? a design spec. So we're going to propose a design spec in terms of what each component of the, you know, of the software will do, what the order, what the order format will look like, you know, what the limit orders and market orders will look like, um, what the message formats will look like. And uh, then once that's set, then we will start hunting for someone to build it. In fact, I've actually already had someone who's reliable and does good work within the project express interest in, you know, running this project, which is great because I wasn't sure if we were going to have somebody in-house or out-of-house do it and you know I just figure it's important to qualify this is that I'm not sure that this person will end up doing it because really it is up to the stakeholders to determine who you know who runs this ball okay so will there be another stakeholder vote to determine who is awarded the contract to build the decks there will be and you know just like I said is that I'm gonna put up, I'm gonna put up a proposal for creating the spec mm -hmm. And you know, no one else has stepped up yet, so I, I don't expect there will be a whole lot of competition on the spec front. And frankly, the spec is going to be, um, from a monetary perspective, a very small sli slice of the work. The bulk of it will actually be, you know, writing the code and making the decks. Fantastic. So, so that that will go to someone else. Excellent. Very interesting. Any parting words? Anything we missed? Um, I'm really excited for it. You know, I feel like building anything big, you have to think months or low numbers of years into the future and I'm trying to do that for the project with the decks but also keep it reasonable in terms of cost so it doesn't get totally out of control. Yeah I, I think on that note if you go back to your iterating Bitcoin uh, blog entry it, it was incredibly prescient that that is as appropriate uh, and relevant today as it was five years ago um, and so I will say, Jake has seen into the future before, and uh, I, I wouldn't ignore him this time. So I'm glad 92% of the community agreed with him. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to uh, all the next steps. And thank you for watching Deep Dive on Decred Assembly. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Cheers.